In the year 1975, Pepsi decided to adopt an aggressive and direct strategy against its rival Coca-Cola with the aim of acquiring a larger share of the American carbonated beverage market, which Coca-Cola controlled at the time. This strategy lasted for 10 years and was the initial spark of a fierce marketing war known as the Cola War between two of the world's largest and most renowned companies, Pepsi and Coca-Cola. The strategy was simply called the Pepsi Challenge, which coincided with the implementation of Pepsi's strategy in 1975. Coca-Cola's main headquarters were situated in Georgia in the southeastern United States, and they held a 60% market share of the carbonated beverage industry in America. In contrast, Pepsi's main headquarters were in New York in the northeastern United States, and along with other secondary soda companies like Dr. Pepper, they controlled only 40% of the remaining market share, and this was disastrous for Pepsi. How could Coca-Cola alone dominate more than half of the market, while others were left with a smaller portion of the pie? So the members of Pepsi's marketing team came together and brainstormed, and they finally concluded that the only solution to gain a larger market share was to focus not only on the quality of their products, but also to shake Coca-Cola's reputation in the eyes of the public, making Pepsi the clear and direct alternative in front of the masses. Pepsi prepared its well-thought-out plan and initiated an extensive advertising campaign in the regions where Coca-Cola held strong influence. They traveled to Texas, the epicenter of the American South, where Coca-Cola was utterly dominant, and there they launched their campaign. Pepsi's campaign targeted the youth demographic and signed contracts with the most important singers and music producers of that time, like Michael Jackson. However, Michael Jackson was not the sole reason that provoked Coca-Cola and led them to enter the battle with Pepsi. The main reason was that Pepsi engaged with people at shopping centers, public squares, and schools. They asked individuals to close their eyes, taste both Pepsi and Coca-Cola, and then choose which one they preferred. The results were astonishing and unexpected for Pepsi, catastrophic for Coca-Cola, as millions of participants in the challenge chose Pepsi over Coca-Cola due to its superior taste and higher sugar content. This took place in cities and states where Coca-Cola held nearly complete dominance. Pepsi capitalized on this successful campaign for 10 years until 1985. This provoked a strong reaction from Coca-Cola, leading to the period being referred to as the Cola War. So, what are the details of this Cola War, and how did Coca-Cola respond to Pepsi? What were the significant milestones in the lives of these two companies? But before delving into all of that, let's explore how these companies originated and what the components of cola are. Let's go back in time, 136 years ago, exactly to the year 1885 in Atlanta, Georgia. An American pharmacist named John Stith Pemberton was working on a formula consisting of alcohol and the extract of the coca plant, which is precisely where cocaine is derived from. The formula was originally developed as a medical treatment for cancer and nerve damage and was called French wine coca. However, when Atlanta banned the sale of alcohol, Dr. John Stith replaced the alcohol with bootleg soda water and added sugar. And that's how we got a beverage composed of cocaine, soda, and sugar. It was then named Coca-Cola in 1886. Six years later, in 1892, the Coca-Cola company was officially founded to produce the medicinal beverage for the public. At that time, cocaine was a widely used medical substance for treating various ailments. However, its trade was later criminalized, and it was classified as a controlled substance. In 1929, the cocaine and coca leaf extracts were removed from the ingredients of Coca-Cola, and it ceased to be a medicinal drink from that point on, becoming a regular carbonated beverage in its current form. Now, let's talk about the creation of Pepsi-Cola. It also started as a medicinal beverage created by an American pharmacist named Caleb Bradham in 1893 in the North Carolina. Approximately seven years after the invention of Coca-Cola, Caleb Bradham developed a carbonated drink that he used as a digestive aid. It was later renamed Pepsi-Cola in 1898. The word Pepsi is derived from the Greek word for digestion. In 1902, the Pepsi-Cola company was established to produce the beverage that we are familiar with today. So, does that mean Coca-Cola and Pepsi are the oldest carbonated beverages? You might be surprised to hear that they are not. The honor of being the oldest carbonated beverage goes to Schweppes, which was founded in 1783 by the Swiss watchmaker 
and amateur scientist Johann Jacob Schwepp. Now let's get back to Coca-Cola and Pepsi. For the 12 years leading up to the emergence of Pepsi, Coca-Cola had a rapid and uncontested expansion, dominating the entire U.S. market and began expanding globally. In 1915, Pepsi also started to spread within the United States and began to compete strongly with Coca-Cola in the American market. Its assets reached $1 million at that time, but Coca-Cola remained superior and had a significant market advantage. Further Furthermore, it had operations outside of the United States, thanks to the competition between the two companies within the country. Pepsi faced a catastrophic event that was far from their thoughts and expectations. After the First World War in 1914, sugar prices began to rise in the United States. The price of pound or half a kilogram of sugar was only 5 cents, but its price soared to over 20 cents and because sugar was a key ingredient in Pepsi, the company suffered huge losses. Caleb Bradham, the founder of Pepsi, believed that prices would stabilize after the end of the war in the late 1910s, but that didn't happen, the prices continued to rise, prompting him to hedge against the rising costs, he started buying large quantities of sugar at the inflated prices, which reached as high as 26 cents per half kilogram. Prices then plummeted to 2 or 3 cents when Pepsi declared bankruptcy immediately in March 1933. At that time, Coca-Cola had emerged as a dominant giant in the soft drink industry in the United States and globally. However, was Coca-Cola also affected by the sugar crisis? The answer to this question is yes. Coca-Cola was indeed affected, but what saved her from the fate of Pepsi or bankruptcy or its international branches, particularly in the Philippines? Through its Philippine branch, Coca-Cola was able to produce its soft drinks at regular sugar prices, thus avoiding the sugar price massacre in the United States. On the other hand, Pepsi did not have any branches outside the U.S., so it fell into the trap. After Pepsi's bankruptcy, a group of creditors purchased the Pepsi-Cola trademark and other assets for a mere $30,000. But then a man named Roy McGarchel, an investment broker in New York, saw potential in Pepsi's products for the future, and he bought all the shares from the creditors for $35,000. Roy started to invest in Pepsi and financed its losses until the Great Depression hit and Wall Street collapsed in 1929. Roy, being an investment broker, faced financial ruin as well, and his companies also declared bankruptcy. He couldn't cover Pepsi's losses, so he filed for bankruptcy for the company for the second time in its history in 1931. On the other hand, Coca-Cola continued to deepen its market presence. Here, Roy turned to a man named Charles Guth who owned a company called Loft's Candies, which sells candies and soft drinks. Roy told Guth that he wanted to get rid of Pepsi. Guth was a savvy businessman, and his company had about 200 vending machines. Each of these machines sold more than 100,000 liters of Coca-Cola per year. Charles Guth went to Coca-Cola and asked for a discount, since he was buying a massive quantity from them, but they refused. Guth decided to take advantage of the situation and buy the Pepsi-Cola company. He started distributing Pepsi at half of his company's vending machines. At that time, Charles was risking his entire company because consumers were accustomed to Coca-Cola and some of them began to reject Pepsi. And because of this, Charles lost over 30% of his carbonated beverage sales. In a moment of despair, he went to the president of Coca-Cola, Robert Woodruff, and offered to buy the Pepsi company for $50,000, but Robert rejected the offer. As for Charles Guth, when he realized that no one recognized the Pepsi brand and that it was losing, the company became an outcast and its market share collapsed. But in 1934, he made a decision that would change Pepsi's course forever. He had nothing to lose and nothing could compete with Coca-Cola. He made the decision to sell Pepsi-Cola in 355 milliliter bottles at the same price as a 185 milliliter Coca-Cola bottle. In other words, the size of the Pepsi bottle was twice the size of the Coca-Cola Cola bottle, but at the same price. This clever move turned the tide and brought great success to Pepsi. It became a turning point, and sales increased significantly. Pepsi needed larger facilities, to the extent that Charles converted one of Loft's candy warehouses into a Pepsi bottling plant. Charles gradually transformed Loft's dedicated spaces into Pepsi spaces and even transferred employees from Loft to Pepsi in order to keep pace with the rapid
rapid sales growth. Pepsi experienced significant growth during this upward trajectory until 1938, when Charles made the biggest leap in Pepsi's history. The Pepsi-Cola franchise was signed across the United States, and Pepsi's budget shifted from loss to profit, reaching $4 million. At that time, Pepsi came back strong and started competing with Coca-Cola. In 1940, they launched a massive advertising campaign by making a promotional song titled Pepsi-Cola Hits the Spot. One million records were produced and distributed throughout the United States. The song became extremely popular, not only in the U.S., but also during the entire 1940s. Its lyrics conveyed the winning deal for the buyer, offering double the quantity for the same price. As for Coca-Cola, it also caused a strong reaction. On Thanksgiving Day in November 1951, they launched the largest television advertising campaign of that time. Airing a 30-minute commercial on CBS, they became the first carbonated beverage company to run a television campaign worldwide. Pepsi didn't stay quiet, and less than two months later, in late December of the same year, they also launched a television advertising campaign. In 1953, Coca-Cola created its own radio station named Coca Time, broadcasting its songs and advertisements. The two companies competed fiercely in the 1960s and acquired competitors. In 1960, Coca-Cola acquired the American Juice Company from Chimit Corporation. In the same year, they also introduced their second beverage, Sprite, which became a huge success. Pepsi had to respond, so in 1965, they strengthened themselves by merging with the American food giant Frito-Lay, which owned famous products such as Lay's and Doritos. This merger formed a giant entity called PepsiCo, which included dozens of brands in the beverage and food industries. At the beginning of the 1970s, Pepsi ignited the competition even further after launching the Pepsi Challenge campaign. As we mentioned in the introduction, Pepsi would go to Coca-Cola's strongholds and make people close their eyes, drink Pepsi and Coca-Cola, and choose which one is better. The challenge was in favor of Pepsi, and people chose it over Coca-Cola. As a reaction to this move, and sensing that Pepsi would take away the market share, Coca-Cola made a crazy move. On April 23, 1985, Coca-Cola held a massive press conference in New York, where its chairman and CEO at the time, Roberto Guizueta, unveiled a new beverage called New Coke after changing the formula of the original Coca-Cola. The new formula was the same as the original Coca-Cola, but with even more sugar than Pepsi. Since people preferred Pepsi over Coca-Cola in the Pepsi challenge due to its sweeter taste, Coca-Cola decided to increase the sugar content. Roberto stated in the conference that the decision to change the old Coke to the new one was the best decision ever made in Coca-Cola's history. He said that they conducted 250,000 taste tests before adopting the new cola and guaranteeing that it would dominate the market. The result was that after the introduction of the new cola into the market for exactly 79 days, Coca-Cola was literally on the verge of collapse because the new beverage failed miserably. Its taste was bad and a poor imitation of Pepsi. Coca-Cola received daily phone complaints from consumers, reaching a total of 10,000 calls per day. People called to criticize them and hung out. The board of directors quickly realized the magnitude of the shock and recognized that changing the cola was the biggest marketing mistake of the 20th century. That's why, on July 11, 1985, Coca-Cola announced in a major press conference that they were bringing back the classic Coca-Cola and apologized to the public, ensuring that this mistake would never happen again. Coca-Cola lost the first round of the Cola War with Pepsi, but they didn't surrender and launched massive advertising campaigns as they invested a quarter of a million dollars and created cans that could withstand space conditions, which were given to all astronauts on board the Challenger space shuttle mission in 1985. They also repeatedly sent their beverage to space for consumption. However, Coca-Cola continued to tighten the noose on Pepsi-Cola with innovative advertising campaigns and a fierce attack. On the other hand, Pepsi wasn't as innovative as Coca-Cola in its advertising campaigns, and until the year 1996, Pepsi incurred losses of millions of dollars after the failure of its advertising campaign, and it lost 47% of its profits to Coca-Cola. That's why the famous Fortune magazine published it on its cover in the same year that Pepsi officially lost the cola battle. This marked the end of the cola war between the two beverage giants, Pepsi and Coca-Cola.
Coca-Cola. The advertising campaigns continue to this day, of course, but they are not directly aimed at attacking the rival company as they were during the Cola War. Currently, Coca-Cola and Pepsi are the two largest companies in the soft drink and food industries worldwide. As for revenues, Pepsi's revenues have been more than double those of Coca-Cola. PepsiCo achieved total revenues in 2022 that exceeded $86 billion, while Coca-Cola's revenues in the same period were only $43 billion. Considering these numbers, we recall that in the early 1930s, Coca-Cola's president, Robert Woodruff, declined to buy Pepsi for a few thousand dollars. And here we come to the end of this episode. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and share the video with your friends.